Welcome all of you to this live program, Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Jiban Sitpadi from Virginia, United States. Dr. Sitpadi is Associate Professor and Director of Trauma at the VC University in Virginia, United States. After his orthopedic residency in PGI Chandigarh, India, Dr. Sitpadi did high surgical training in the United Kingdom. He then completed his fellowship in orthoplasty and trauma at the VCU Health System in Virginia, United States. Dr. Satpadi has been doing trauma and orthoplasty for more than 20 years with a special interest in pelvis tabular work and total knee replacement. He's currently the director of trauma in VCU Health System, which is a level one trauma center serving the state of Virginia. His multiple publications with a focus on reconstructive surgery as well as trauma, notably on femoral retroversion, as well as periprosthetic fractures and geriatric fractures. If you noted, Dr. Sitpadi has delivered several lectures on the channel and it's already reached a huge audience. And today is my great honor to bring back Dr. Jiban and the Sitpadi for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Jim. Thank you, Vitesh. And uh, thank you for this great platform. Um, I think it is helping millions. Uh, it's wonderful work. So I'll register you. So I'll start uh, my presentation. Um, this is basically, I've integrated the current evidence available with my experience uh, to help mostly residents and fellows and even also probably attendings who are interested in uh, uh, arthroplasty. So let's start. I'll start with the basics. All right, so indications. Uh, for me, indications would be KL4 osteoarthritis. That's minimum. I think it's important to have bone and bone. The results are poor when the arthritis is not bone and bone. So I think it's an important aspect uh, of decision making uh, when you perform a total replacement. AVN with collapse, obviously pain has to be affecting their quality of life and activity of daily living. Uh, again, this is an important aspect. If you don't have pain, just having arthritis does not need to have a knee replacement. Uh, obviously, all of them sort of uh, an attempt at conservative treatment uh, with various modalities that is available prior to considering the replacement. Approaches, I'm going to just briefly overview the everything available. I prefer medial parapetular approach. Um, I think uh, as it is extensile, you can always extend it with any complications or any issues. The downside is uh, sometimes there is a possibility of failure of the medial repair leading to a uh, patellar maltracking or even subluxation. Um, I tend to repair in about 70 degree flexion um, to prevent this complication. Um, obviously, if you have to do a lateral release, you already have done the medial release and it can lead to uh, patellar complications. So those are the nuances for a medial parapetellar approach. Lateral parapetellar is used uh, specifically for fixed valgus deformity. It certainly helps uh, for the lateral release, uh, but uh, patellar resurfacing can be very difficult. Midvastus, uh, again, uh, quite helpful um, to improve the patellar tracking. Uh, certainly the downside is it is less extensile. It be difficult in obese people or with severe deformity. Um, there has been questionable injury to VNO on EMG studies. Subvastus is again, um, significantly quadricep absorbing, so improves tracking quite a bit. Again, it's less extensile and will be difficult in all of those above conditions as I described above. There are certain things you can add like a quad snap um, or a tibial tubercle osteotomy, BY turndown, or a tri-vector approach. I won't go in details, but those are the tools that are available in the more difficult cases. Um, now, first thing before considering a total replacement would be alignment. Now, there are various strategies for alignment with newer techniques and newer concepts coming up. Certainly has a likely bright future. I'm not going to go in details. This is a good article published by McFacy in a bone joint journal. Uh, if people are interested to learn more about alignment or coronal plane um, alignment uh, knee classifications and stuff. So it's a, it's a good article to show various methods available. I typically use mechanical alignment. I have used a little bit of adjusted mechanical alignment depending on uh, deformities. And um, uh, But at this time, I, I'm not into functional or unrestricted kind of alignment. 
I think that's probably the future, but I need more data before I change my practice. Um, so coming to typical alignment strategy, um, I use mechanical alignment uh, as everybody's familiar with this, uh, you know, you get 90 degrees to the mechanical axis of femur and tibia. It does change your uh, normal axis to, to a different axis, which is the idea uh, behind coming to functional alignment or kinematic alignment where they follow the normal alignment of the femur and tibia versus changing it to perpendicular alignment, the biotic parting more releases. At this time, this is the best data available, so that's where I go. Um, I do typically a major resection for various knees, um, but I do a mix of major resection and gap balancing uh, for valgus knees to prevent uh, malrotation and imbalance. I will uh, talk about it uh, briefly when I go through each of the knees, how to do this. I typically don't change my angle. I do measure it preoperatively, the mechanical axis versus anatomic axis, and I keep it at five degree fixed. I don't change it if I find a six degrees or seven degrees or three degrees or four degrees. If the, if the angle is different between anatomic and mechanical axis, I still stick to five degrees. My worry is that changing the numbers based on preoperative measurements can be fallacious depending on how they position the leg. Sometimes there is a bigger anterolateral bow and it can increase the angle uh, fallaciously. Or if they have a deformity in the knee, which is there very often, it can also change the angle. So my worry is you can falsely cut higher or lower angles if you change from five degrees. So I stick to five degree valgus for my femoral cuts. Now, this is a common question for a lot of surgeons, uh, PS versus CR knee. I do both. Um, I think there are pros and cons to each. And this is my decision-making tree. This is how I decide whether I go for a CR knee or a PS knee. A young, healthy patient with an intact ACL and healthy PCL is critical for me to do a CR knee. Also, if I don't plan to do a patella, I would do a CR knee. There is a data to show there is a higher revision rate on an undersurface patella with a PS knee. And it does make sense. In a PS knee, your, your runner groove for the patella is smaller or shorter because it, it disaccommodates the box. So your tracking does get affected and no wonder there is a higher revision if you don't resurface. Uh, in a PS knee. So something to think about. Uh, also, a correctable deformity and a mild to moderate deformity is important for me to do a CR knee. I would prefer PS knee and more severe deformity due to unhealthy or contracted PCL. Again, people can do differently and there is arguments for and against it. it is, this is just my algorithm. Um, for PS knee, again, um, unhealthy PCL, I usually do PS in a valgus knee, uh, in, a, in a fixed valgus deformity. If I resurface patella, I typically choose to do a PS knee. Any doubts of PCL being injured in trap? I'm very careful protecting the PCL, and I'll show you how I do it on the later slides. But if the saw goes back further than I wanted it to for any regions, then I would rather do a PS knee than to worry about PCL uh, getting uh, stretched or detached or rupture at a later time. And like I said, severe deformity, I would consider post stabilized knee. So I use it interchangeably, probably more PS than CR just because the patient population I deal with. But again, I wouldn't be against or for it. Whoever wants to do it, whichever way it would be, would be okay based on the data available. Now, I mentioned a little bit about patella resurfacing. I don't resurface all patella. Uh, if there is a healthy patella or arthritis in the same set of deformity and the patella is a type one or type two with Berg, then I would uh, con consider preserving the patella on all CR knees. If the type three or further out, they're more deformed patella, there are multiple studies there to show that they do 
have patellofemoral uh, altered mechanics, pain, and possibly higher revision rate. Uh, as about, I've cited two articles that there are more there. Uh, so just be careful at leaving a, a patella that is more dysplastic uh, than a type two. Um, certainly, if there is full thickness cartilage loss on both medial and lateral facet, uh, then uh, yeah, consider replacing it. Uh, thickness less than 20 millimeter is a relative contraindication. There are papers to show that actually it doesn't matter. Uh, my experience uh, and from uh, some of some papers, there is a higher risk of fracturing it if you're not careful. Uh, while it is doable, it's not an absolute contraindication, something to think about carefully. Uh, I already mentioned about PS new, the higher revision rate when there is when the patella is not resurfaced. So consider resurfacing the patella on a PS knee. Uh, my insulin is standard. Um, I use a hand breath, four finger breath above the patella as the top part of my incision and below I go just past the tuberosity as I saw in this picture. I stay medial as most of the people do at the tibial tuberosity so potentially people can kneel. Um, From that point, uh, medial to parapetillar versus midvastus versus subvastus, depending on um, which way you want to go. Uh, one thing to remember here to make sure to develop full thickness flaps, uh, the fascia layer must be attached to the subcute area. Um, so I tried to develop a full thickness layer at this point, particularly thin fascia, you can get full thickness skin necrosis if you're not careful. Uh, so make sure you have a fascia layer is attached to the uh, subcutaneous tissue when you develop this flap. Uh, the question about patellar eversion versus patellar subluxation, um, I think there is argument for and against on both. Um, patellar eversion, I feel like is a little bit safer um, uh, particular subluxation is a little bit safer in my hand, although data uh, have uh, shown both ways. So ultimately, it's a choice you can make. Um, there are papers showing that if you don't invert the patella, they have less pain post-op, and there are other multiple, at least two randomized prospective trials that shows no difference in pain. In fact, one shows higher patella tendon injury with the uh, when you don't avert the patella. So again, uh, my view is uh, you do what you feel comfortable. Certainly if patella is ba'a or low lying patella, then I prefer not to avert because they tend to rupture the patella tendon because of the significant stress. Uh, but the patella is in normal position or ulta, certainly eversion would be ideal to have a better exposure. The big advantage for everting the pata is a better exposure of the lateral tibial plateau, or the lateral crown of the plateau. So one one worry about not everting the pata is you may not be able to see the most lateral side of the plateau. So you can potentially underhang or overhang the lateral side. Again, if you have a good exposure with one or other, I think I would recommend you stick to whichever one works for you the best. Now, coming to um, sequences of release, um, I tend to, first thing I do is assess uh, under anesthesia before I do any of the cuts. I would check if the deformity is correctable at least to midline or past midline. If I can correct the deformity, I do very minimal release, release enough to protect the saw from hitting the ligament. Other than that, I don't release anything, either medial or lateral in a, in a, in a vas versus valgus knee. So that's my first step when I go in uh, doing a knee replacement. My next step if is not correctable, then uh, for a varus knee, I would start releasing the deep MCL, which is the part that is attached to the proximal tibia, the closest to the articular surface. So I release, I start with the mid coronal plane. Um, that will be uh, my release there. And then 
I remove the osteophytes, specifically the ones under the ligament. They tent the ligament, and that might be all you need many times to um, correct the deformity. So uh, please make sure to remove the osteophytes from the ligament. Um, once I release that idea, assess uh, what is correctable, if it is correctable or not. Again, if it is not coming to at minimum erectus position or possible a little bit over correction, then I would consider going further back. I would release the posterior expansion system amaurosis. Try not to go more than a centimeter below uh, the posterior tibial articular surface to avoid instability or releasing the superficial MCL um, posteriorly. I, um, and then if that fails, after I release the past mid coronal plane, all the deep MCL, and also release the expansions of the semi membranosus up to a centimeter from the articular surface. My usually my algorithm next is a medial tibial reduction osteotomy. Again, before you do that, you need to make sure that if you have enough tibial plateau in a small tibia, this will be not the sequence. In a larger tibia, what you can actually downsize the uh, tibial base plate without any adverse consequences, that's when you would consider um, removing uh, at two to three millimeter of the medial tibia. So this step would be, before you do this step, uh, you need to make sure that you're, you've already sized the tibia uh, and then uh, you can downsize the tibia to a smaller size. If you can't downsize the tibia, then please don't do it. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it will be in deep trouble. Um, and then, like I said, adjusted mechanical alignment. If it is still tight, I would consider uh, a, a slight medial, uh, like a varus cut. I'll, I'll feather out medially a little bit to allow those components to sit slightly various. Again, it's a choice you make. You've got to be careful uh, when you do this. I'm very comfortable doing this if I have to. Um, you know, two to three degree varus wouldn't change much, would allow your, likely to allow your correct the deformity at this time and also open up medially. Then the next step would be, if that doesn't work, my last step would be a pie crusting the MCL. Not many pokes, uh, usually stick to a few pokes and then stretch it out, it usually works. So at this point, uh, almost all of my knees are corrected. Um, I do not release the superficial MCL. Um, there is the intraband and a posterior band. If I have to, I have sometimes done the intraband, but that is your chakra. Chakrin. You really don't want to release the facial MCL if possible. Now, I know surgeons do it, some people do it and haven't so much adverse effect. It certainly makes the knee unstable. Uh, if I do it accidentally, if it has happened, I put them in a brace post op for six weeks and then let them mobilize after that. But that's that will be probably my uh, red line. I try not to cross uh, from that point. So I'll pre preserve superficial MCL if you have to. You can release the entry band, but leave the post band. Otherwise, it'll open up quite a bit in flexion. Now, for valgus knee, again, the same sequence. Uh, again, assess the correct ability. If it is correctable, uh, then don't do any releases. Just just enough to put your components and do your soccer. Uh, certainly, obviously, you don't want to do enough, any medial releases, but you do have to release about it few millimeter medially so that you can put your saw, otherwise it will cut the ligament, so it will cut your MCL. So make sure you'll be able to put the retractor medially and protect the saw. So you do need to release some, but not more than that. Now, if it is a fixed deformity, then um, I typically uh, do my femoral cut, the distal femoral cut, tibial cut, and then I put lamina spreaders on both sides, um, tensing it equally. And then I start releasing um, what I call pie crusting. I use an 11 blade for that. You need to make sure you don't poke through past a centimeter. It's usually the nerve is within 15 millimeter from the posterolateral corner. So just have to be careful how much you poke. Um, 
I use my both hand uh, and just use carefully a couple of pokes. I start posterolaterally. Um, and then um, again, IT band is usually tight and extends and I pike, I pike thrust uh, multiple transverse cuts along the um, IT band. Um, usually 10 pokes usually works for me for both these areas. Um, if it is after you release this, um, if it doesn't work, then your next step is to release the popliteal of federal ligament. Uh, you have to find it under the uh, popliteus muscle belly in the, in, in the intralateral in the intralateral area. And next step would be to cut the arcuate ligament. It is deeper to the popliteus, and you can see it well uh, in flexion. Uh, it is best done uh, in flexion as well. Um, you have to put something behind to make sure that you don't go past it because you'll probably damage the nerve trying to release this. Um, I would never release the populist tendon if possible unless it's really, really, that's the only structure that is tight. And then, yes, I would consider, but that's another one like the surface MCL. I would never release the public as if possible. It'll open up your flexion space quite a bit. It'll be hard to balance it afterwards. Um, so typically, typically you don't do a bony cut in valgus. People don't tolerate very well. And cutting it more valgus more than three degrees would be um, likely very unsatisfactory outcome. So I prefer not to cut, do bony cuts to align uh, my deformity. Uh, on the valgus knees. So that's something is no for me. Uh, for me, um, femur first versus tibia first. I do femur first. Um, I use uh, a depuni tuni. Um, so the thickness is about 6.8 millimeter in the femur. So I take about nine millimeter from distal femur. And as I mentioned, I take about uh, in a five degree valgus irrespective of what I measure um, because of various regions I already mentioned. I feel like if you do femur first, it opens up the tibial space uh, for me to do my tibial cut easier. So I prefer femur cut first. Now in various knees, I do all my femoral cuts. I complete my femoral cuts and then go to tibia. In valgus knees, I do my distal femoral cut, then do my proximal tibial cut, and then I do my balancing, as I mentioned about pike thrusting. And then I'll show you in a later slide, I put my uh, four in one jig and use a bone block to assess my femoral rotation and uh, in a, it's a, a, a rotated depending on what opens up. And I'll show you in a minute about that. So it's a mixture of gap balancing for, uh, with major resection for the valgus knee, but it is a major resection for me for the VRS knee. And I just give an example of um, how I assess my rotation and change my rotation. You see the epicondylar axis is drawn um, on the left figure, and then uh, I use the white side line, and they are obviously perpendicular there. Uh, so my my markings are correct. And then when I actually use the posterior referencing uh, for my, my sizing and rotation, and I put my pin, as you can see, it's internally rotated. The pin on the medial side is lower, uh, rotating the femur. So I could see this. Uh, I always check this after I put the pins. And then I corrected the rotation to match my epicondylar axis in the second slide. Um, and uh, obviously it, it balanced my gap in a subsequent uh, check. So something I do, you've got to be careful uh, making sure you're exposed well, medially and laterally to palpate uh, the epicondyles. I usually come from above down palpating my finger and where it starts to dip down is what I uh, consider the apex of the epicondyles. Um, that helps me, I find that's the, to me, it's the easier way to feel it. And for white side line, I use my um, 
entry point hole like mark the center of both and a center of cochlea and connect these three lines and um, uh, typically it gives me a reproducible white side line on every case. So that's, I uh, was trying to show the, how do I gap balancing? Now this is typical, this is a varus knee, so I haven't done my tibial cut yet, uh, but normally I would have done my tibial cut at this point, uh, and then I put my bone block after taking out the capture from the bottom for the jig, and I assess inflection, not eating inflection, I try to open medially or laterally. If the medial lateral opening is symmetric, then my rotation is correct. If the medial lateral opening is asymmetric, then depending on which way it's opening, I would correct my rotation to certain degrees. Uh, obviously, again, it's restricted kinematics. I wouldn't go past significant amounts of five degrees or so. Uh, but I tried to say if it is opens laterally means I am internally rotated. So I would rotate the uh, jig externally. If I'm opening medially, then I would uh, do the other way around. Uh, assuming that my ligaments are not over-released or uh, I haven't damaged anything, obviously I would know that or check it uh, before I change my rotations. So that helps me a lot. The valgus knee, as you know, valgus knee is a hyperplastic lateral femoral condyles and is very common to internally rotate the femur. So that's why I use uh, the, that technique. Now coming for the tibial cut, I uh, typically use that osteotome. If you see that on the first slide, uh, compared to the second slide, I put I use a marking pen to mark the osteotome about one and a half centimeter above the tip, and I slid that osteotome just into the PCL uh, when uh, to protect my uh, PCL during the sock cut for the tibia. Um, I use the I leave the bone block intact, even if the bone block separates, as long as my saw hasn't gone past, I'm okay with that. I do my I complete that box cut using osteoterms prior to lifting um, that uh, the bony cut of the tibia. As for uh, rotation uh, for the tibia, I typically use the ACL PCL as my line and then um, I use the uh, tibialis entry at the bottom uh, for my rotation. Um, and typically it works for me. I always use a as use a alignment rod afterwards, both in flexion and extension to confirm that the, the rod is in line with the tibia um, even after doing all these checks. Um, and then when I do my cuts, you can see uh, the retractors must be parallel to the slot of the saw. And this is critical. Keeping the retractor vertical will not protect you from cutting through the ligament. So it's, it's critical to keep the retractors in line. And this is especially for obviously um, experienced surgeons know what to do for beginners. I think it's important to understand just putting a retractor will not protect the MCL or LCL. You need to keep it parallel or in line with the saw cut to prevent it. Adequate exposure is important. Like you see circumferential exposure uh, to make sure you can see all around uh, again and protect the patella tendon uh, while you do this as well. So some of the nuances of gap balancing and uh, how to fix it. Um, and I, I think this is all book stuff that you know, but I'll talk through some practicality of it and how you do it intraoperatively. Uh, your extension gap is tight. You recut the distal femur. Now you need to you need to make sure that you actually have released the posterior capsule before you go and redo the cut. I typically measure my joint line. I check it. Um, from the medial epicondyle, I have to be at least two and a half centimeter below. As you do more cuts, um, you can elevate the jawline and increasing the risk for mid flexion instability. And if you have a PS knee, when you recut after you have done all the cuts, make sure your box cut is 
uh, again completed. It always cuts less in the box and all your distal cut doesn't work if the box is not deep enough uh, because you won't sit down and ultimately you'll still remain tight. Uh, people don't tolerate flex and deformity, so I never accept tight extension gap. And this is assuming a tight extension gap with a normal flexion gap. Now, if you have a tight flexion gap, depending on the type of implant using, uh, downsize the femur. Uh, for my system, I can also either anteriorize or posteriorize the femur uh, to get a little bit of more uh, laxity or tightness entered in posteriorly. But typically, if you can downsize the femur, it will automatically open the posterior femur. You can also increase the slope uh, slightly, uh, assuming it's a CR knee. If it's a PS knee, just to make sure that you don't have a reverse slope, because you might just be able to cut the slope appropriately and be able to open up the flexion space. Now for loose extension gap, uh, it's a more difficult problem uh, because many systems do not accept augments. So it just might have to, depending on what systems you're using. Uh, for me, I can apply distal augments, um, but if you don't, you might have to consider using a revision femur. Uh, again, these are more challenging problems for you. You might have to use a stem and stuff. So loose extension gap, changing, uh, putting augments uh, sometimes is not always possible. Other, other thing is you can downsize the femur and then increase the thickness of the poly um, if you have um, some play on the, um, on the flexion gap as well. A loose flexion gap, you can upsize the femur. Again, upsizing femur doesn't always work because what will happen is you upsize the femur, you have a big gap. Uh, on the backside. So that's something to think about. A pegged implant works well for this, uh, but just remember, just upsizing the femur keeps, uh, uh, you know, it opens up the space uh, between the implant and the bone, and you may not be able to fold it that way. It will change your, potentially change your rotations and stuff, especially with the CR knee. Um, so just be careful as you upsize it, just understand that it will open up that space there between the bone and implant. Again, you can consider using augments, but many times it's only tiny, so you may not be able to do it. Now, last one is asymmetric extension gap. This is easier. It's probably tighter on the side that is uh, not opening. Um, but a flexion gap is a little bit more tricky. If you have asymmetric flexion gap and your ligaments are intact, like, like you haven't released the superficial MCL or cut the public tendon, and then it is mal rotation. Like I mentioned before, a asymmetric lateral flexion instability means you are internally rotated. So if your flexion gap opens laterally only and rest of the gap are okay, then your component has rotated internally. You have to externally rotate the femur to correct that problem and vice versa if it opens up medially, then you're excessively externally rotated again, assuming all the ligaments are intact. Now I use a uh, certain kind of cementing techniques and most of the people probably use it. I think uh, all of these are evidence. Uh, make sure the bone is completely dry. Uh, it's as dry as a bone, as we say. Now. I always pre-cut the tibia and femur. There's studies showing that it does increase the cement integration and avoids fat on the tibia and femur. Putting fat on the femur and tibia does reduce its pull-out strength and increases the risk of aseptic loosening. So I put a thin layer of uh, cement all around the tibia and all around the femur, a smaller amount um, to make sure that um, there is no other debris between the metal and cement. I do make dry drill holes using a very small um, tip of the, uh, the pins I use basically for the, for the implant, for the instruments. 
I use a tip of it to make about 10 to 15 drill holes on either side of the um, bone on the femur and tibia. I pressurize the cement, which most of you do. I pressurize it first in the medullary canal of the tibia. So as you pressurize it, you'll see the fat comes out of the side and I use suction to make sure all the fat actually sucked out. Um, and until that all is dry again, I wouldn't put more cement. So make sure that when you pressurize, suck out the cement and then remove all the fat when you're pressurizing. After that, you put more cement on the actual top surface of the tibia. Uh, same thing for the femur. I don't put much cement on the medullary canal. Obviously, in the femur, I put a small plug just to plug it. As you know, it does reduce the amount of post-operative bleeding by at least uh, 20%. Um, I try to dry the back side of the femur uh, with a lap, um, make sure there's no fat there again. Uh, and then again, we have cemented, pre-coated the femur before. Um, so I think uh, a lot of these has been people already do. Uh, most of the surgeons practice this. For, for those who don't, uh, this is a good technique in my experience and also based on evidence. So please, please pre-cut the tibia and femur on both sides. Uh, it does increase your production significantly. That's uh, all the intraoperative pictures. Uh, you can see uh, the drill holes on both sides. Um, they're very tiny holes. They're not like, I don't go past three, four millimeter even uh, in the bone. So they're smaller holes just to increase the surface area of the femur and tibia. As you can see, I'm starting with the pressurizing the intramedullary canal. Uh, one thing to remember there is that I tip my holes are usually smaller. The peg, the, the, the stem is not long. And then make sure that you have not violated the canal below and there must be a bone uh, block below. Uh, I usually don't push the suction down too much there so that uh, the bone block at the bottom stays. Uh, so that the cement actually does not go past that and uh, you don't have a, like a large dose of cement all the way in the tibia. Uh, so if there is a hole um, opened up to the metallic canal, then you might consider plugging it with a bone block um, or maybe a cement plug if you if you have really <laughs> open it up quite a bit. Um, and then uh, once I do that, I, as you can see the suction there, digging out the fat, and then I then I pressurize the top surface of tibia with the rest of the cement, a thin layer of cement. And then um, that's uh, pretty much for for me. Um, I usually put uh, the final poly at the same time. Make sure to keep the uh, knee in uh, full extension uh, as you, as the cement is getting hard. Um, I leave it for 15 minutes without moving it. There are studies showing, <coughs> excuse me, that if you move it during the time when the cement is getting hard, it does increase the risk of aseptic loosening. So please keep it straight for about 15 minutes, which is the cement setting time <coughs> for the cement I use. Um, and once the cement is hard, I usually drop the tourniquet at the end of it. I typically use tourniquet uh, for all my cases. And then um, make sure you look around for the, any excessive cement, which I would have actually removed it during the cementing as well. But then as you put in full extension, sometimes there's some cement extrusion. Uh, so just check it around. Don't leave any blob of cement there. Um, I typically um, close in uh, 60 to 70 degree flexion. <laughs> um, typically I use uh, interrupted Vicro for my arthrotomy and quell uh, sutures, which are like barbed sutures uh, for the rest of the closure for the arthrotomy. <laughs> Excuse me. And then I use running proline for running monocle for my subcut tissue. Um, I use running proline for my skin. You can use running monocle as well <clears throat> for the subcuticular layer as well. And this is the protocol we use in the hospital as a group. So we've been following the same thing. I don't think there is any anything wrong in using any other way. This is just what I do. Now coming to some of the 
nuances uh, during the surgery of primary needs, some basic stuff. These are very uncommon complications, uh, but can be very problematic. Um, it's common in PS knees, breaking the condyles uh, on soft bone. Um, I usually put a buttress plate. You can use a small frag or, or even a large plug, depending on the size of the person and buttress it. Um, you can, I would consider bypassing this with a stem. Um, <clears throat> usually if you bypass with a stem, you can let them wait there. If I don't bypass with a stem or if they can bypass for some reason, then I would protect that weight bearing for six weeks uh, without any restriction and range of motion. Uh, plateau fracture is even less common. Um, I use, uh, again, uh, a buttress blade. I also use a tensor band wire construct. I put a screw on either side and put a loop of wire to hold it. Seem to work well for me, uh, especially in a revision setting, but also in a primary setting, it can be helpful. Again, bypassing a stem would allow it to wait bear early. <clears throat> um, but let tendon rupture, um, again, um, is a devastating complication, very high failure rate with a direct repair. Uh, but obviously, uh, at the time, probably this is the best option, having a direct repair and immobilize for six weeks or suture and course and same thing, protect it for six weeks. A little high risk of stiffness and complications and a lot higher risk of re-rupture. Um, I won't go in detail what can you do afterwards, but uh, avoid it uh, is the best way to uh, deal with these things. Uh, and the biggest thing is a good exposure um, and then uh, maybe uh, in a but a lot of bar situations, just be more careful pulling it. Um, in a very difficult situation, I do even snip uh, to reduce the stress in the tendon and increase the force higher up because that snip will give out more than the tendon itself. Um, LCL, MCL injuries, uh, again, avoid it at any cost. You put the retractors appropriately. I always, always put a retractor under the deep, under the MCL, uh, under the femur when I do my femoral cut. Uh, put a retract on the proximal tibia parallel to the cut, so in line with the shawl, uh, so you don't cut. Uh, it, my typical ways of injuring I have seen is uh, when the when the retractors are not placed appropriately. Uh, the other thing is if the MCL is not released enough to apply a retractor just under the saw. So those are the typical ways I have seen uh, injuries. And if you do, if it does happen, uh, I usually increase the level of constraints to semi constrained knee. I do a direct repair of the knee in about 30 degree flexion. Uh, usually it's the intra band and uh, usually the results are actually good uh, if, you have, if you have followed the steps up, up there. Uh, vascular is extremely rare. Uh, I always check pre-op pulses and post-op pulses. It's important because some of them don't have the great pulse. So it's important to know what was their pre-op to assess what is their post-op. Any change in pulse would warrant a duplex atriogram. I've seen um, uh, at least uh, twice where you can have a pulse and they typically have a dissection. So the saw hits the artery but doesn't cut it, but ruptures the intima and it produces a flap uh, of the intima and that starts to block the vessel. So you may have a pulse bite after, but then the, the dissection increases and the entire thing gets clotted. And then you have a pulseless leg. Uh, unfortunately, it can get, end up in amputation. So, uh, having a pulse a post op does not mean that they have no vascular injury, um, but any change in pulse is what is problematic. And then you should do a vascular. If you have a change in pulse, get a duplex. Uh, you probably will be able to catch up most of the devastating complications. <laughs> get a vascular surgeon immediately. Um, nerve injury, uh, mostly in the valgus knees. Um, I am very careful for the valgus knees. We actually, in our institute, we, uh, on a valgus flexion contracture, we do a prophylactic common peroneal nerve release. Um, we get a nerve surgeon, and you can do it yourself too, um, to release the peroneal nerve through a separate incision, a small separate incision laterally. Uh, we published this in Arthroplastic today. We had no palsies in this number of cases we did. Uh, all of them had severe valgus flexion contractures. <clears throat> um, so I don't know whether the small number 
can prove that you should do a prophylactic release on every one of them, but we didn't have any issues by releasing the nerve early on. Uh, so we are encouraged by the results. Uh, we still consider releasing the nerve in a severe valgus flexion contracture. If you do get a post-op palsy, then keep the knee in flexion over six degrees for 24 hours, and then uh, many do recover, some don't, and then in which case, uh, obviously, AFO start early gabapentin to minimize neurologia. In my experience, more than 90% recover in six months, although they are measurable until then because of neurologia. Um, stiffness, uh, I uh, tend to do early MUA, and um, if I don't, if I'm not successful, arthroscopy lasts for four to five months. There, as I said, extents and deficits are harder to correct, so make sure intraoperatively correct any extents and deformity, um, and they don't do very well afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Jib, uh, for yet another brilliant talk. Jib, you can stop sharing. Thank you, Jib, for yet another fantastic presentation. I could see a lot of people online, maybe 50 concurrent, and I'm sure this is going to reach to a big crowd. Uh, Jib, uh, let's take a few questions. Yeah. Now, Jib, uh, there are some surgeons who use a circumpetellar cautery, something kind of a patellar denovation instead of going for a patellar resurfacing. So have you seen people doing that and what is your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I used to do that too. I still do. There are papers uh, suggestive that they're not useful. They don't do actually much. Um, <clears throat> the studies are not in a very large numbers and uh, I still feel like there is no harm doing it. So until there are some bigger studies showing that it is actually not going to do anything or it is harmful, I feel like I'm going to go with uh, my old old uh, practice and continue to consider denervating the patella when I don't uh, resurface it. It's a feel good thing, right? When you denervate it. <laughs> I think that I've been doing it since my residency. I mean, there are studies to show that it actually does not do. Uh, there's no difference if you do or do not denervate. But these are underpowered studies, and I'm not sure. Uh, I don't see there is any harm, so I'd rather do it than not do it. And Jib, uh, our channel co uh, I mean, caters to people from different parts of the world, right? So infection is one of the top issues. I mean, if you go to lesser developed countries, so right. there are some surgeons who started using vancomycin prior to wound closure, especially in spine surgery. It started off with spine surgery, and of course, some surgeons do it for hip and uh, knee as well. So what is your take on that? Do you use it? Do you think it's going to be of significant benefit? I use it on every revisions. Uh, I do on every revisions back in October, actually. Primaries uh, are a lot more cleaner surgeries. On high risk patient, I still do. Um, we tend to uh, optimize everybody uh, entirely before we do surgeries on any arthroplasty. Their BMI has to be under 40. Their albumin has to be over three and a half. Their hemoglobin has to be over 12. Uh, and then the A1C has to be under seven and a half, likely under seven. So we tend to optimize them. Uh, so risk of infection for us is extremely low in primary, but I have been using uh, powder on diabetics, rheumatoids, um, severe deformity, longer surgeries. Uh, I also give them on doxycycline for seven to 10 days or cephalexin for seven to 10 days on people with CHF and renal failure on, on diabetics specifically. Uh, based on the Madigany study from Indiana um, on a, giving a prophylactic antibiotics for seven to 10 days. And we use on all our revisions six weeks of oral antibiotics actually. So based on our practice and based on what's available, we tend to use uh, those things as well. Thank you, Jib. And uh, Jib, you know what? I did my fellowship with uh, Dr. Rajesh Maniar and Arun Mulaji in Mumbai. And those days, I mean, the Leelawati and British Candy Hospital. We used to have ultraviolet uh, rays in the OR. After surgery, we used to keep the UV on for 20 minutes. And only after that, we used to go for the second surgery. So do you think that's there in the US? I mean, do people do it in the US using the UV in the OR? 
no, not for routine practice. They do use what we call true DUVs for mostly like um, uh, like COVID. But as a COVID uh, patient before, they have been using true D out of allied rays. It is not a routine practice for normal cases, uh, uh, normal thing. We do not use out of allied rays. With laminar flow and uh, routine cleaning, um, uh, we, we didn't see any difference in uh, the rate of infection using ultraviolet versus non ultraviolet. And body exhaust suits always, right? We have been using, although you see New Zealand registry data are actually not supportive. In fact, it might be counterproductive. Um, overall, I feel like it is more protective to us than the patient in a way. Um, but, you know, we have been using it all the time. And what has been the data on body exhaust suits uh, versus not? New Zealand registry, actually, if you look at it, it shows slightly higher risk of infection uh, on people who have used body exhaust suit. Um, so again, I don't know what to take out of it. We don't see the difference. Uh, at this point, uh, without any strong data to support for or against, uh, if you like, uh, it's a lot, lot more cleaner ourselves. We don't touch with a mask or something. Things don't get touched. Your body's sterile. So, we is basically in a way I feel like it's more protective in a way to us. You know, things I let me say I'm using cement and say I'm chipping on a cement spacer, things hit out and fall back, right? You know, things happen. So it protects. Uh, I feel like it, it is protective. But if you ask me, is there evidence to support it? I would say there is no strong evidence to support it. And Jib, one of the other key issues with uh total knees, pain control after surgery, right? So there have been a lot of newer ways, multimodal analyses here, and even high adductor canal block. Adductor canal block is being trending. I mean, a lot of people do it. I mean, there have been some concerns of using an adductor canal block in the sense that some surgeons believe that the nerve to the vastus medialis arises much higher in the canal. So the if you're giving a block, it should be very high. So what is your take on that? So uh, there, there are two two things about it. So I would tell you, I mean, I used to use a electric canal block on every one of them. Um, uh, the data does not support it. There are some mixed results. Some says yes, some says no. There are a couple of things that can go wrong with a electric canal block that I found out with experience and from other people too. One thing is if you give a high electric canal block, it can also block the femoral nerve in the retrograde flow. And then you can get a quadricep weakness in the fall. At least I've seen one patient with a rupture per left tendon, unfortunately, because of a high adductor canal block. So you just have to be very careful when you put adductor canal block uh, before the patient is mobilized, make sure they have an adequate quadricep function because occasionally they do a uh, retrograde block and block the femoral nerve. Second thing I've been seeing people with saphenous neuralgia with the adductor canal block. Um, I've seen at least seven people now with saphenous neuralgia, um, uh, which I think are related to adductor canal block. I just have to look into it. Uh, but this is a problematic situation where the benefit is controversial, but the downside could be significant on some patients. Um, so I would be, I have completely gone away from adductor canal block on uh, any of my patients at all. And there is no good data to tell me that it actually is more helpful than the, the, the local periarticular infiltrations and multimodal analgesia. Okay, so what is your primary, I mean, what's your go-to method, analgesia? Uh, leave the urea, the epidural, anal, I mean, for one or two days, right? And what else do you get? So we use a preoperative uh, salicoxib and, um, um, and Tylenol, one gram of Tylenol on every patient. And then um, we stopped pregabalin. We used to give pregabalin, but we got people some dizziness, so we stopped that. Um, intraoperatively, we use a thing called REC, R-E-C-K. It's a combination of Robivacin, of 50cc Robivacin, 100%, epinephrine 1 in 1,000, chlorine 80 microgram, and a chloral of 30 and mixed with a volume of 100 cc. So we call it a REC, it's R-E-C-K. Uh, we inject REC uh, in, uh, post-operatively uh, or in, intraoperative at the end of the surgery. And then um, I uh, post-operatively, if they get, again, multimodal anesthesia, where you get Tylenol, you get Tramadol, and then you get some sort of narcotics uh, for a couple of days. We do use gabapentin for younger folks post-operatively um, on people who don't have any you know, older folks, we try to avoid it. 
and they get Celebrex for three days postoperatively. It, people who are not used to narcotics and not on it before, they do very well with this combination of stuff. People who are already been on narcotics are always problematic. You can't do a whole lot other than adjusting medication based on their needs. This seemed to work for us and um, has been a, has been a good success other than people who are already on a lot of narcotics properly. And what about intravenous dexamethasone on the day of surgery? So we used to do that. Um, one of our guy, Gagalde, he uh, studied this and found that um, uh, dexamethasone does increase your blood sugar level significantly. Um, and there are multiple studies now. If you see recent studies by, I think, Lieberman, um, they said that if you're even um, preoperative blood sugar level over 197 on non-diabetic, on 193 on non-diabetics, uh, 276, if I recall, on diabetics, uh, seem to significantly increase the risk of infection. There's another paper that published uh, even one one level of over 137 postoperative uh, blood sugar level can increase the risk of infection postoperatively. So dexamethasone, while it is quite helpful, uh, it has its nuances. <clears throat> the question is how much benefit you're going to get from dexamethasone versus how much you're going to risk uh, a postoperative postrigital infection. Uh, we moved out from that. We used to do that before. Thank you, Jib. Jib, one last question before I end the session. Now, Jib, uh, there's so much of interest in robotics, right? Mako, Korai, everyone comes out with, with robotics to the extent that we have almost every other week we have a uh, CME or a meeting happening. Right now, a friend of mine is doing one in Mumbai on robotic knee to the extent that people come to us asking, okay, do you do robo or no? Okay, then, so what I tell them is like, see, I, I like to behave like a robo, then is that okay for you <laughs> during surgery? So so what is your take? Our people, and recently what happened is I checked one of the centers in the UK, they're moving out of robotics. They say that the cost is too much and the time taken, infection rates are higher. So what is your take in the US? Is it just only a marketing tool or really offers significant benefit to the patients? So my take is two ways from here. And this is what I think uh, is, a, is a thing that might be, you have to think which way you want. So if you are going for a mechanical alignment uh, concept, a, a guy like if he says you're a efficient surgeon, you're precise, you don't need a robot to tell you how to cut. But you can cut at 90 degrees any day, right? Yeah. Now, that's based on mechanical axis alignment, right? Now, if you consider Magdesi's concept of coronal plane alignment, steep acnes, or if you go for kinematic alignment or adjusted kinematic alignment, a restricted kind of alignment, or whatever, the newer alignment technologies, I think if you do that, then robotics is the future for that. So time will tell like what we can do, are we going to adapt to this uh, concept of say functional alignment, which seems to be the most attractive to me with the restricted boundaries, right? Um, so if you want to cut it at a five degree varus, that's going to be hard. If you want to cut it at 90 degrees, you can't, right? Or maybe there'll be jigs coming up where we can put a 33 degrees, two degrees, five degrees jigs, and then cut it and we don't need a robot to tell that. But if you want to change your alignment to adapt to a certain kind of alignment for the knee, it'll be very difficult to reproduce that every time. So that's where robot will have a role. At this time, it is all marketing. It is, at this time, a robot can't tell me how to cut a knee. I know how to cut a knee. It is more about the feel. You need to get the ligament balancing the robot can't tell me. Although there are veracents and ultrasense and stuff like that, there are stuff there. Ultimately though, the surgeon has to make the decision intraoperatively and robot is not going to tell you. But, but if you do adapt to the new alignment technologies, I feel like robot has a role. So we have to see time will tell. Thank you, Jib. Uh, thank you. That's all the questions that we have for the session, Jib. Yet another fantastic lecture. And I can see it's already reached to a huge number of people and really look forward for more in future. Jib, hosting you has been such a great pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity, Hitesh.